Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to the book of Acts now, Ecclesia. Praise His name for who He is. We're praising Him today for who He is. We're praising Him for all that He does, because He does great and mighty works in these last days. Hallelujah, and He's going to finish this this time that He has given us with great victory. He's going to have a Ecclesia that is going to go home with Him and before too long. Amen, amen. And we send this shout out to you today. Amen. In the name of Yahshua. Glory. Amen. Just receive His Word. Receive what He has for you. If you need healing, He's got it. If you need just comfort, He has it. Hallelujah. If you need good thinking, He has it. He will bless you. He'll touch your soul, your mind, and give you right thinking and right speaking because he wants you to speak as he is speaking hallelujah love joy peace and understanding hallelujah in these last days amen pastor bishop jerry bowers is coming now with the precious holy word so just receive today and rejoice with us because that's what we're here for that's what we're wanting you to do in his name in the name of yeshua amen amen are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Yes, hallelujah. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Nothing broken, nothing missing on God's covenant day. Amen. Yes. So I want to invite you to open your word with me today. And we're, we're going to open to um, Acts chapter 4. And uh, as you're doing so, or on your device, some people use their... There are phones for tuning in and checking things out, right? So Acts chapter 4, and uh, I'm going to remind us of uh, what the context is. In Acts chapter 3, a man who has been sitting for 40 years at the gate of the church, come on, people had to step over, step around and avoid him in order to get into church, and they left him in his condition Lame and broken. That's a bad testament for the church. Somebody should have stopped and, and done something. And so as, here comes John and and uh, and, and, and Peter, and uh, <clears throat> they see the guy, and the guy looks at them as if they're going to give him a quarter or something, you know, for alms. It says, expecting to receive. And Peter says, "This is Acts three one one to six. Peter says, Silver and gold have I done, but such as I have I give unto you. And the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, took the man's hand and raised him up. He's never walked a day in his life. Amen. And all of a sudden, he's got muscles developed on those legs and perfect balance. He can one, he, he can run, walk, jump, and he goes into the temple, begins to praise God and upsets everything. The formalism is all out of joint. <laughs> Their program is put to the side because they know who this guy is. We've seen him for how many, you know, week after week after week for 40 years. And now he's in here running and leaping and jumping. What has gone on here? And it says in chapter 4, it, this is so striking that 5,000 people come to believe in Christ because of this miracle. And that's more than the day of Pentecost. 3,000 came to Christ on the day of Pentecost. Wow! Yes. It's not church as usual anymore. But uh, I, I point this out to you because in chapter 4, when people are asking, well, what's gone on? What's happened? We pick up the story in verse 2, and being greatly disturbed. Now, this is the religious leaders, right? They're disturbed by this. You'd think they would say, hey, hallelujah, miracle, right? But no, they're disturbed. They're disturbed because the disciples taught the people and preached in uh, Jesus, or in Yeshua, the resurrection of the dead. Amen. Now, the reason is the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. You have just trampled on one of our, our doctrines. Our doctrine is there is no resurrection. So, you know, people get that way. They get so focused on doctrine and their dogma that they, they forget what really matters. Salvation is that people come to faith and knowledge and life in Christ. Their lives are restored, they're healed, and they have salvation. That's what we rejoice in, not dogma. 
And, and so they're freaked out because he, they, these guys are teaching that this man was healed because of the resurrection power of Christ. Now, this is important for us because the disciples went everywhere preaching the resurrection. Amen. And I just want to note this. If you visited the churches in any community and asked yourself the question, how often do they preach on the resurrection, you're going to find most do not. They might do it on Easter, you know, the pagan holiday. Um, but for the most part, churches don't preach on the resurrection. Something is, something is lacking in our understanding about the, uh, the preeminence of teaching about the resurrection. So look with me now um, down to verse 10. Let it be known, this is, this is uh, the Apostle Peter uh, speaking here. Let it be known to you all. See, don't you like that? They even use you all back then. <laughs> That's where we get it in Texas, right? Where we say you all. <laughs> Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him... This man stands before you whole. So he's making it clear that by this man who was raised from the dead, this man is made whole. Now, what they're trying to say to you is, there is a power and a life in the resurrection and a message of the resurrection. That if Christ be raised from the dead, you also can partake of that resurrection life. Paul taught about it quite a bit. In, uh, in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, he says, If the self-same Spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in you, He'll also quicken or give life to your mortal body. Amen. So there is a way to partake of the resurrection life, and they taught it. In fact, it says they went everywhere teaching about the resurrection. Yes. Wow. The power of the resurrection. Uh, verse 23 of the same chapter. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported to, to them all the chief priests and elders had said. Now, they were forbidden to teach any more in this man's name. And so, uh, they called the people to prayer. And beginning here in verse 24 is the actual prayer that they prayed. You want to know how they prayed in the early church? It's actually written right here in chapter 20. Uh, excuse me, chapter 4, beginning with verse 24. And then look at verse 33. And with great power the apostles witnessed to the resurrection of the Lord. Amen. That was the purpose of the anointing, is to preach the resurrection. And beloved, this needs to come back to, to God's church today, to God's ecclesia today. What is the resurrection? And how can we preach the power of the resurrection? What's missing and what needs to come back? Oh, my goodness. Uh, go with me, if you will, to um, Romans chapter 6. And here we have an application of the resurrection power. So Romans chapter 6, and uh, verses 5 and 6. Now, this is talking about baptism, water baptism by immersion. And so, uh, if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, and we should live no longer to sin. So, what he's saying is, and let's throw in verse 4, Therefore, if we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Baptism is identification with the death and resurrection of Christ. So if you've ever seen anybody baptized, they close their eyes, hold their breath, they're plunged under the water, buried with Him. They come up out of the water, what's the first thing that happens? They start breathing. If the water's cold, they really <clears throat> start breathing. Like like at uh, Reuben's dad's farm when we baptize some folks out there in the in the tank, right? <laughs> so when you come up out of the water, start breathing. 
That's a symbol. I'm starting a new life. I've been raised to a new life. Now, is the water magical? No. It symbolizes a covenant. And so, because you're identifying in this covenant of baptism, the reality of what it symbolizes is supposed to take place in your life. So, the old person, the old Jerry, the old Marine, his old life is buried with Christ in the watery grave. And when he comes out of the water, he's got a new heart. He's got a new mind. He's become a new creature, a new creation, the Bible says. And he's going to start a new life with Christ. That's the resurrection life and power. Now, there are lots of benefits that go with that that should be taught with the message of the resurrection. What can we expect? Well, we can expect that we have direct access to God. You don't have to go through a person or a priest. We have direct access to God. And, and so it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, Come confidently and boldly before the throne of grace, that you might receive grace and mercy to help in time of need. We get to come direct access to God through Christ, who's our high priest. Through Him, we get to come directly to God and receive everything we need. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ. Everything we have need of. That's the resurrected life. And the purpose is to live for Christ and give Him glory. That people will know Him. Not because we, you know, we teach a, a good doctrine. They will... You know what the greatest witness is for Christ? It's not dogma. The greatest witness for Christ is to see a changed life. Because people can argue with your do, a dogma or your doctrine. It's hard to argue with somebody who says, I once was dead and now I'm alive. I once was trapped in drugs. I, I once was, was held captive by sin. I met Christ. He's given me a new life and changed me. You can't argue with that. You see, that's, that's the resurrection life that God wants us to put on display here in the world for people to see. So they can believe, oh my goodness, if he could do that for old Reuben, he could do that for me. You know, that, you think about it now. The disciples, were before Christ got a hold of them, were they really holy men? No, Peter was a foul-mouthed fisherman. They didn't have truck drivers back then, but if they did, he'd have probably been a truck driver. Right, Mike? <laughs> and so he cursed. He had bad language, just like this old ex-Marine. At one time, I struggled with language. But when God got a hold of me and changed me, may be different. Now, think what happens. Peter goes back to talk to the people who used to know the old Peter, the guys that are still fishing, hauling freight out there in the boats. And they look at him and they say, you know what, something's different about him. He looks different. He's not the angry guy all the time. And not only that, his language has changed. Not every other word is a curse word. Because God has raised him up to a new life through the power of the resurrection and made him a new man. That's what we want people to see and to demonstrate. This is real, people. This is real. This is the resurrected life. Wow. Uh, I want you to go with me to see Christ uh, using this himself. Uh, go with me over to John chapter 11. I love the gospel stories because we get to see it come alive. And this is the reason that if you all haven't seen The Chosen, you can get the app, right, on your phone. You should. Because it, what it does is it makes the life of Christ come alive. And uh, we have people all over the world now following this series. Um, and the astounding thing about this is no Hollywood studio produced this. This was produced in Texas. Not far from here, actually, uh, over by Granbury. This was produced with what they call crowdfunding. People would just volunteer to, to donate or pass it on, pay it forward to somebody else. Do you know that over a billion people are following this now in the world? And they're saying, how could this happen? You can't even do that in the theaters. How could this happen? Well, because people want to know what it's like to be on a journey with Christ. That should say something to us. And, and so 
we want to be a part of that journey so people can see it, right? So here we are on a journey with Christ today. We're in John chapter 11, and it's the story of Lazarus. And so it says, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany. Now, Bethany is about two miles from Jerusalem. And uh, and I've been there. It's primarily an Arab town. But um, this was a favorite hangout for the Lord. He enjoyed going here and spending time with Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And he would, you know, rest and relax, and he could just be himself there. It's always good to have friends like that, amen? And, uh, and so he gets word his friend Lazarus is sick. So in verse 3 it says, Therefore the sister sent him, saying, Lord, behold, him who you love is sick. And when Yeshua, Jesus, heard this, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified. And so now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard this, that he was sick, he stayed two more days. That don't make sense. He heard he was sick. Instead of rushing, it's only two miles, right? Instead of rushing to, from Jerusalem to go help his friend, he says, well, let's just hang out a while. And they're like, well, I thought he was your friend. And then after he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you. Why would you go back there? They want to kill you. And so Jesus answered and said, Are there not twelve hours in a day? Talks about walking in the light while you have it. And then he says in verse 11, These things, he said, after they said to him, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I might wake him up. And the disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he does well. And then in verse 14, he plainly says, Hey, guys, he's dead. Lazarus died. And uh, I'm glad for your sakes. Well, I thought he was your friend. Well, no, because you're going to get to see the glory of God. And so, you know, they walk the two miles back to Jerusalem, or to Bethany from Jerusalem. And uh, then Martha, as soon as she heard that he was coming, went and met him. And so, so now Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even so, whatever you ask God, I know he can do. And so Christ said to her, your brother will rise again. And she said, yes, I know, at the resurrection. And he said, I am the resurrection of the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he will live. And whoever live, lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord. And then along comes the sister. And he goes, has to go through this with her and tell her the same thing. And so, <clears throat> therefore, verse 33, when Yeshua saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. The shortest verse in the Bible now is in verse 35. You know what it is? He wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. Now, why did he weep? He knew he was, that Lazarus was going to live again. He was, he was there to raise him from the dead. Why would he weep? He wept because he cared about his friends. They were hurting. He felt it. You know what? He feels it when we're hurting. And he wants to bring to us the comfort we need. And the Jews said, said see how he loved him. And, uh, and then verse 38, Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and a stone laid against it. And he said, Take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. In other words, he's decaying, he's rotting. It's been four days. And then he said to her, Did I not say that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And they took away the stone and the place where the dead man was laying. And 
Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. This is instructive. Before we pray or minister or do something in in terms of sharing the Lord, we should always ask the Father if he has something. Take time to hear what God wants before doing a ministry of some kind. Who is our dependence on? And then he cried out in a loud voice at verse 43. I would have loved to have heard that. Lazarus, come forth! It's a good thing he used the word Lazarus. Because if he would have just said, come forth, you know what? Every dead person in that vicinity would have risen from the dead. Yeah. Literally, uh, the voice of Messiah woke up the dead. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was wrapped. So his whole body can look like a mummy, right? His whole body's wrapped in a sheet. Even his head. How did he get? How did he get up? Somebody who's been there said there's actually a step in the tomb that you'd have to step up in order to get up on the the ledge. But here he is. Listen, when God calls you to do something, even if you don't have the physical means to be where you need to be and do it, if He calls you, He will put you where you need to be. And He needed to be at the entrance of that tomb. And so here he is. In my mind's eye, I can see him. He's like, mm-hmm. he can't talk either. He's rap, right? Mm-hmm. He knows he hears the voice of his friend. And he says, unbind him and let him go. Unwrap him, unbind him, and let him go. Listen, this is the power of the resurrection. When God calls us forth to serve him, He's going to release us from the circumstances that keep us from being where we need to be and doing what He wants to do. He's going to unwrap you from all the hindrances in your life that keep you from experiencing His new life and resurrection. Well, what do I do about all... Listen, you just respond to the voice. Stand up and say, Yes, Lord. He's going to unwrap you And remove everything in your life that will keep you from serving Him. But what about the bad language? What about the addiction? What about the, uh, you know, the lack that I have in my life? Listen, when you hear the voice that says, Lazarus, come forth, and you hear it, and He's calling you, you respond to the voice, and He unwraps you. And He said to the crowd that was there, let Him go. Now, this is interesting to me. Because the believers who were there were called upon to do something to the man who was bound. Is he not calling us to help unbind people and loose them? Let them go free. Take my freedom to the people that are wrapped and bound. Unwrap them. Let them go free. And it may only just be your testimony and your word of faith that will help that next person. You know, this week Reuben was out in the park with his shofar. He's got the biggest so far in the house. And Reuben was out there in the park blowing it. People were coming up. Hey, what is that, man? Tell me what that's all about. It, I, can I hear that? You know, and so he could tell that's the voice of God. That's what it represents. You got the tall one. You got the short one. And, when, and it represents the first person that used this was God to call people to Mount Sinai to hear him. And it was used also to assemble uh, the people of God. And to assemble the army, it was used to to sound the charge or to gather the people. It's the voice of God. And so here's Reuben being obedient and using that out in the park. And and people are hearing the voice of God because they're coming up to him saying, well, you know, man, what is that? What are you doing? (laughs) And then Reuben prayed with him, right? So we just bless you. Use that all over town. Go to Walmart, check, just check out the parking lot and shake up the parking lot. That'd be good. Unwrap some folks. (laughs) 
Amen, amen. I have to tell you, um, in my own life, I have experienced the truth that we need to get out of this. The gospel without power is not the gospel. The gospel of Christ is supposed to set people free. It's supposed to give them new life. If all it is is head knowledge and dogma, I'm sorry, that's not the gospel. A lot of people have head knowledge. I got my fire insurance. I'm not going to hell. Listen, that's not just what he wants. It, you can try to avoid hell. But listen, why don't you have a new life and experience the power of the resurrection? That's what he really wants. That's why it says in Mark chapter 16, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out devils and lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That's the gospel with power. But it's missing in the church at large, most churches today, because we've forgotten about the resurrection life and the power of the resurrection. So when I came to believe in Christ, by the way, it was during the, uh, what they call the Jesus Movement Revolution. There was a film out recently on this. I was in Hawaii serving in the Marine Corps, and uh, I was probably 25 years old, just a young guy. And uh, this was back in 1978 kind of the tail end of the Jesus movement. And Chuck Smith, who was the pastor that was used in Southern California for this, he was there doing a, a, you know, um, a concert and a preaching, and and, uh, they made an altar call, and I went forward at the altar call. I didn't know it was the Jesus movement. And uh, a little Air Force, 18-year-old Air Force girl, sat down with me behind the curtain and shared the gospel with me from the Gospel Road in Romans chapter 6, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Romans 6, 23, 24. And asked me if I would like to receive that eternal life. I prayed to receive it. And I have to tell you, it was life-changing. I got hungry for the Word. I wanted to know more about this man. I wanted to know more about this new life. They said, now next Sunday, we're going to meet in the park under all these palm trees with guitars. And we're going to sing. Well, I didn't know that was a Jesus movement. I said, okay, cool. We're going to the park. You know. <laughs> but it was, my point is, it was life-changing. And uh, I, I spent time seeking God and the Word. And the more I did, the more changed. And I wish I could tell you that overnight everything became different. But some things I had to battle with. Now, um, God removed tobacco addiction from me. Um, he removed any desire from alcohol. And, uh, but I struggled with language because in the military, every other word when people are talking is bad language. You know, it's like hanging out with truckers, you know what I mean? It's, you know. <laughs> and, uh, I remember saying, and, and the devil was beating me up about it. You're not cut out to be a Christian, just forget it. So I said to the Lord, Lord, I can't change. I want to change this. And I feel bad when I take your name in vain. I don't like it. And he said, you hard-headed Marine, you can't change your heart. Only I can do that. I said, what am I supposed to do? James 4, 7. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. I said, Lord, you took all that other stuff. Why can't you just take this? (laughs) He said, well, look, if I just set you up there on that mountain and you didn't have to go through the valley and fight, you wouldn't learn to have faith and you wouldn't learn how to battle and have victory. I thought, wow. So, you know what? It it took. I wish I could say it was immediate, but i got to tell you, it it took over a year. I would get a train of thought that would go through my mind, and I'd think, that's that's not me. The devil was putting thoughts in my mind. Anybody ever have that happen? You get a song stuck in your head, and you can't get it out? It's that kind of stuff. And uh, so what the Lord was teaching me is, James 4, 7, submit to God, resist the devil, he's got to flee. So when the bad thoughts would come to my mind, that's what I would do. No, I belong to Christ. I resist this. This is not me. I will not accept it. I resist this. It must leave. And it would begin to lighten up. And finally, it just didn't come back. So I, I want to encourage you. You're walking in the resurrection life of Christ. Some things he will just overnight, he will transform them. Because we have new desires, right? We have a a new heart, new mind. But there are some things where the enemy will attack. And and guess what? With men, I want to tell you what it is. With men, 
Now over 60 to 70 percent of men, even in the church, struggle with pornography, with sexual addictions and, and thoughts. That's a stronghold. And we have to fight against that. And with women, you know, there are other things that the enemy hits them with. Women struggle with that too. It's true. And so when that happens, that we submit to God, resist the devil, take a stand and, and just state, I belong to Christ. That's not a part of me. I resist it and let up. Amen. And you'll gain the victory. But that's a part of the resurrection life of Christ. We have to teach people how to walk in the resurrection power. And it largely comes from, yes, your faith, but it largely comes from this. We have to learn how to activate this and claim this because we get our power and victory from this, which is what Christ used, the temptation in the wilderness, when he was tested by the devil. He says, it is written, and he used the word to combat the temptation. Yes? Yes? That's an example to his followers. We want to do the same thing. Amen? So I want to encourage us uh, going forward this week to believe in the power of the resurrection. You can have the resurrection life of Christ in you. Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by the power of the Son of God, which is the resurrection. And we want to appropriate that. We want to walk in that, not just dogma. I have a personal conviction about this. It's okay to have belief system and doctrine about end time events. I like understanding end time events, prophecy, you know what I mean? But I think that 90%, if not more, of what we focus our minds on and study should be the gospel, the life of Christ. If we're not an expert on the life of Christ, we shouldn't be spending a lot of time on all that other stuff. Because, you know, there, I, I know people that they live and breathe and they just talk about life, you know, end of life events and the mark of the beast and what the beast is going to do. It's okay to be informed about that stuff. But listen, primarily who, what you need is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so spend time in the Gospels getting to know Him so you can walk in the resurrected life. Then you have a word of hope to give to people who are freaked out about what's coming next after, you know, yeah. After all the sickness and viruses and stuff, what's coming next? Well, what's coming next is we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. You ask me how I know He lives? He lives within my heart. That's what people need to know. Amen. And hear a testimony of somebody that's been resurrected and who lives it, who lives it. Now, I, let me just throw something out to you. Um, we've spent a lot of time over the last year or two talking. We, have, we had a class on um, activating, you know, victory in Christ, uh, the healing journeys with Christ, and uh, how to minister deliverance and healing to somebody else. Unless you believe you have the resurrection power of Christ, you're not going to be effective. And so if I minister to Margie and I lay hands on Margie and pray for Margie and I believe that the resurrection power is available, I can release that. I'm going to ask her to have faith in what I'm going to pray. Do you believe Christ died for you? Do you believe that it, as we hope in him that he can restore you? Yes, I do. Well, let's release that. And before I'm done praying, I'm going to say something like, I'm believing now, Margie, with you that the resurrection power of Christ is yours right now. And you have victory over whatever that is. And both of us, let's grab hold of it. I was on a phone call. I'm not going to use any names, but I was on a phone call. We were driving in the car. And um, the husband of a, of a woman who was in the car, who was in a, you know, a different city, says... Uh, I'm having terrible neck pain. And I said, well, what, what, on a scale from 1 to 10, what is it? It's a 10. So we prayed for him, and we took authority over the neck pain. And we rebuked the neck pain. And the spirit of affliction 
that has been hanging around on this person from, you know, all kinds of things happening. And as we were praying, he started weeping on the phone. And I said, uh, come on, what's, what's happening? Something's, I feel it. God's touching you. What's happening? The pain, the pain is leaving, it's leaving. Well, of course it's leaving. <laughs> That's what we told it to do. And then we're able to give some counsel to this man in terms of, of surrendering to Christ and believing in him. He is the answer. Those, these are the kinds of things when you start releasing the resurrection life of Christ that can happen for people. But we believe in it and then we begin to speak it and then we release it. We'll see God touch people. We'll see deliverance. Now there are some people, some Christians today who believe that signs, wonders, and miracles and healing ended with the apostles and it's not for today. And the reason they say that is that because... They don't see it in their church, and some ministers teach this. Uh, since we don't see it, it must not be for today. So they're making a lame excuse. And that's all it is, is a lame excuse. Well, how do you know that, Pastor? Because in 1 Corinthians 1 7, it says the church, God's ecclesia, the church will come behind in no gift, waiting for the appearance of Christ. All the gifts are still supposed to be in the church. The church will come behind in some gifts. Is that what it says? No, it says the church will come behind in no gift. 1 Corinthians 1, 7. I stand on this. I don't care what men says. The church will come behind in no gift. So let's start believing for it. And speaking it. That means that signs, wonders, and miracles are still for today. Healing is still for today. Casting out demons is still for today. Yes. Having, you know, Christ said to his disciples in Luke 9, 1, he called his disciples into him and gave them power and authority over all devils to cast them out. Oh, well, you could pray against some of them, but you better not deal with principalities and powers. They're too great. No, he gave you power and authority over all devils to cast them out and to heal diseases, to raise the dead and cleanse the lepers. Freely you have received, freely give. That's what it says. Why don't we stand on it? I spent some time with uh, some Baptist friends teaching them about the ministry of deliverance. Margie and I went to Israel. And we're getting ready to go again in May. And we brought back anointing oil from Jerusalem. And I gave it to these precious ladies. And I said, now, you've learned about what the Bible says on deliverance and healing. And the disciples, according to Mark chapter 6, went everywhere anointing with oil for healing. So if that's what Christ taught his disciples, should each of us own oil? Should each of us be carrying a bottle of anointing oil? Well, yes, we should, because that's what Christ taught the disciples to do. And should we use it? Well, yes, we should. Uh, Marge, I need to refill my oil. Um, we're going to <laughs> buy some more. You make your own? Awesome. That's like plying the blood on your house. And, and there are a lot of homes that need that. We do, Margie, lift that up again. We do have a bottle from Jerusalem here that if you want to full, uh, fill up your own personal little oil thing, feel free to use it. We'll leave it up here in the altar. And uh, you can fill up your little bottles. But... But this is something that the people of God need to use. It's a tool. It's a weapon that God gave. And uh, it's not just, oh, I'll get my preacher to pray. No, we're all a part of a royal priesthood. And all of us are supposed to be able to do these things, which is why the fivefold ministry that um, apostles, are there still apostles? Oh, yeah, there are. are uh, prophets, are there still prophets? Yes, Catherine. Are there still evangelists? Yes, Reuben. Are there still um, pastors? Um, yes, Carl. Are there still teachers? Yes. With the, Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit. And so we are to equip the people for works of ministry, it says, at Ephesians chapter 4. And this is one of the works of ministry. And so I want to encourage you. Uh, when I was talking to these Baptist ladies, I gave them the oil and I said, Now, can you see yourself anointing people for deliverance? And they're like, Oh, no, we can never do that. Yeah, you can. If you're a born-again believer, you have the same Holy Spirit I have. 
that Christ gave, let him use you and believe. You know what it was that Christ said in, in John 14, 12. Greater works than these that I have done, you will do because I go to be with the Father. Are you a believer in the greater works? Do you believe he could use you to do the greater things? He wants to. But first, we've got to get a hold of that message of the resurrection. He wants to release that power in you and me. Amen? All right, let's close with that. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for um, all these believers who are here today. We do believe that Christ died and rose again for us. That in Him we have eternal life. But He wants to manifest the resurrection life in us so that we become a walking testimony of what it means to be free. And so use us, Lord. Anoint us today. And use us to touch somebody else. And like Lazarus, you can say to us, unbind them and let them go. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us to be a part of that witness. We ask in Christ Yeshua's name. Amen. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Before we end, um, our altar is open. If